you mentioned the, the pencil and different languages and, and different people using it for different things. And you're absolutely right. As I mentioned, you could fashion, fashion a bunch of these into a pitchfork. But when it comes down to identifying what is this is, what is this? We ask the question, well, what did the maker create it to be? And then that's what it is. And then we may use it for other purposes, right? But it it is, in that sense, a pencil because we the maker told us that's what he made it to be, right? And we may have used it for something else, and it will never work as good at something else as it will for its original use, you know. And that's I think that's a big thing that expands over all sorts of human, you know, aspects of humanity, right? Where we use something that was intended for something different, and we kind of make it work, but it was actually made for something better. And if we would use it for its original intent, it'd be that much more beautiful. Hi, Corey. Welcome to Shifting Dimensions. It's a pleasure to have you on the show today. How are you? I am great. Thank you so much. I'm really excited to be here. Yeah, I'm excited to speak with you, Corey, because you have a very interesting background. Obviously, you're a pastor, you're an author, um, you're also a speaker, and you also describe yourself as a tenacious pursuer of truth. And you wrote a book called The Magnetic Heart of God. So we have a lot of things that I want to cover today, but I want to start off by asking, have you always been spiritual? Hmm. Have I always been spiritual? You know, I, I would say that I think that we all start off spiritual. I think we all start off um, with an awe that we are something unique in the universe. And that there is a boundlessness to us. And I actually think that it's over time that we get bogged down with this idea of biology, of, of flesh and nervous systems. So I don't know if I'm avoiding your question or if I'm answering it, but I guess I would say, I think we all start off spiritual. And then some of us just gradually um, lose our deepest sense of self and start to view ourselves as something less than we are. So I think that it's less of a matter of people becoming spiritual and more of a matter of people have progressively become less in tune with who they are. Um, I don't know if that answers your question, but that's the it, way I guess I would answer it. It does actually, because I think you're touching on something that I feel like I've always been aware of since I was younger, which is mm. this idea of something much greater than what mm. we can see with our physical eyes, right? Um, what we can feel, what we can touch, this innate knowing that there's something within us that can't really be described. I mean, we call it a soul, we call it a spirit, but there's a part of us that has this desire to connect to something much greater than this human experience that we are witnessing or what we perceive to be our, our only human experience, if that makes any sense. Um, yeah. So I think that that's what you're talking about, which is interesting because I remember just always thinking whenever I go into conversations and people are talking about the purpose of life or talking about certain things related to their jobs or mental health, I was always kind of stuck in those conversations because I'm like, what about the spirit? I feel like the spirit, if we kind of try to go a little bit deeper, we might be able to kind of answer and understand a lot of the things that we're dealing with as human beings. So, mm -hmm. and I know that you talk a lot about that in your book. So what inspired you to write your book, The Magnetic Heart of God? And, and what is it really about? Yeah. Well, thank you for asking. What inspired me? I, I would say what inspired me was a revelation and an awareness that I couldn't keep silent. Um, my you know, just to give you kind of a, a short, really short version of my journey to this point. You know, I, I grew up very, very poor. Um, and I often will, um, will mention to people, you know, but by, by poor, I mean like really poor, like homeless in the forest kind of poor. And, um, but there was always in me this burning question to answer, why? Why are things the way they are? Why is my family different than other families? Why are people pursuing the things they are, feeling the way they are, saying things the way they are? Very small. I was asking those questions. And so to make my long story short, the question why led me to philosophy. I was hard going to philosophy at a very young age, you know, Plato, Aristotle, Confucius. 
Um, you don't find the answer to why in philosophy. In fact, philosophy really asks the question why more than it answers the question why. Um, philosophy led me to neuro, I mean, to uh, psychology. You know, surely we can find the answer in in all these brilliant minds or supposedly brilliant minds. And for a while, I was really big into Freud, and he, of course, his answer to the whole idea of the development of personality, the id, the ego, the superego, consciousness, all these all these things that Freud was kind of at the forefront of really diving into. Um, I would say at this point in my life that, again, uh, uh, psychology is an evolving science, and it does not answer the question of why, um, which led to neuroscience, which is a little bit more fact-based, perhaps, than psychology, right? We can talk about neurons firing and the effects of dopamine and serotonin and the neuroplasticity of the brain and all these wonderful things that we talk about in neuroscience. Fascinating. Didn't answer the question of why. And the reason I believe that I that none of these really answer the question in a way that is satisfactory is because at the end, end of the day, it's kind of, um, it's like the study of sort of um, mechanism instead of source. You know, we're, we're studying um, in, in the study of those things, we're studying theory, we're studying um, shallow biology and we're not answering the question, the deep, deep question that we all begin with, right? Like I said, I think we all start off spiritual. We all start off with this wonder of, and this big sense of self in the universe. People don't feel, when you're a child, you don't feel small in the universe. You tend to feel pretty big in the universe, unless you're unfortunate enough and you've been beat down at a really early age. Um, and so ultimately why I wrote this book was philo philo uh, philosophy, our psychology led me to philosophy, philosophy to neuroscience, and neuroscience ultimately to what I would say is faith or spirituality. And the realization that to say that we are um, spiritual beings is more than a theoretical statement. I believe that it can actually be scientifically borne out if we actually follow the proper scientific method. Um, we each intuitively know that we exist beyond biology. It's just that very few of us live that way. And so in writing this book, I was really trying to do that. I'm saying, hey, you're, you're running around trying to find meaning of, of life and happiness and peace and all these terms that are actually pretty vague terms when we think of it. You're trying to find them in all these predictable places that never work. You're looking for them in wealth. And unfortunately, it's never enough. And um, we look, you're looking for it in power. Well, again, power is never enough and it can always be taken away. So you're always living in stress. You're looking for it in sex. It's never enough. You're looking for it in all these different places. And the world, despite all of our many benefits, has, is more unhappy than ever. Um, and I think that the reason for that is because we have not been looking for um, the solution to these questions to the depth that they're actually being asked. See, it's not your, it's not your brain that is asking you to find meaning. It's your soul. And so it is the soul that needs to be answered and it is the soul that needs to be explored. And I truly think that's the missing link in today's world. There's a whole lot of PhDs out there that have, have forgotten the most basic truth about themselves. Mm, that was so good. Thank you, Corey, for sharing that. And I, and I agree so much with everything that you're saying, because I think we lose that sense of ourselves. And like you said, we start to look for meaning and value and purpose in worldly things, right? Whether that's power, wealth, being accepted into a group of people, whether that's love, um, romance, however you want to describe it, but it never really feels enough. I remember having this moment in my life where I could physically feel this hole in my heart, like, I felt like something was missing that I needed to fill it with, right? And, you know, in that moment, I sought out relationships. I, you know, sought out more education and it kept coming up empty, right? Or I would do things to distract myself or have coping mechanisms and I kept coming up empty. And on my journey, I've always been a very spiritual person. I've always been a very curious person. Um, and that has always been in me, but I think I had an epiphany one day when I realized that I think what I'm searching for is a connection, an intentional connection to that spirit part of myself, to, to God, to this source that is greater than I could even imagine that's within me 
and around me all the time. So I really love how you broke that down. And I kind of want to dig deeper into your faith journey a little bit more, because you talked about going from philosophy to psychology and then eventually to faith to answer the question, why? So just to make sure I fully understand the why question that you were looking to answer was what is the true nature or the purpose of why we're here? Is that correct? Yeah, exactly. Why are we here? Why is all this happening? Right. So can you just talk a little bit about your faith journey? Were you reading the Bible? Were you going to church? Because I, I know you're a Christian, mm -hmm. correct? Mm -hmm. So yes. how did you kind of get deeper into the word or the Bible to kind of get to that answer that you were, you know, searching for? Yeah. I remember a moment when I was 20 years old, 20 years old, something like that. Um, I was sitting in a little kind of little office that I had, and I was reading the Iliad by Homer, like for the hundredth time. I've read, read that book so many times in my life. And of course, it's this, it's the Greek mythology, right? The story of the Trojan War, Hector and Achilles. And that it's a very interesting, one of the one of the earliest works of literature. Uh, fascinating. I've always loved to read ancient works. Right. And not just read some modern take on an ancient work, but let's read the ancient work. Right. Let's not hear someone talk about Julius Caesar. You know, we can actually read Julius Caesar's words. It's fascinating. Anyway, but I digress. So I'm reading the Iliad for, you know, uh, after reading it many times. And in there, it starts off by talking about, uh, you know, you have the Greeks and there's kind of these gods that are on the sides of the Greeks. And then you have the Trojans and there's these gods that are on the sides of the Trojans. And not only are the Trojans kind of, and Greeks are at war with each other, but these gods are at war with each other and they're stabbing each other in the back and they're having affairs on each other and they're trading sides and all, all this stuff's happening. It's just chaos. It's utter chaos. And I remember it's like I sat up and I said to myself, God isn't like this. God is not fallible and crazy and unfaithful and malicious like we are. So if he's not like this, who is he? And I would say that really led me to a lifetime of wanting to ask that question. Who is he? Um, and not just on in a superficial, um, somebody tells me an answer and I swallow it kind of thing, but in a real invest, you know, investigative type way um, with a lot of trial and error. And I would say that that moment was what really, because ultimately I had grown up, you know, in a Christian home up to that point in time, though I, though I wasn't living a Christian life. And, you know, I might kind of identify myself as a Christian simply as a way of one human identifying with another group of humans, but I certainly, you know, wasn't a practicing type, um, quote unquote, believer. Um, but that that moment was when I became. Um, and that was really what you know, delved, delved, delved me into a lifetime of, of wanting to find the answer to that question. And then when I found the answer to scrutinize it and dissect it and and really make sure that I got down to the deep depths of things. And that's what I hopefully, ultimately, I have come to in my book. I really kind of share a bit of my journey. Um, but when I first wrote it, uh, I shared it with, uh, like in my original you know, manuscripts, I shared it with some people and they all came back with the same word. They said, we love the content, but it reads like a thesis. You know, because that's kind of the way my mind works. Um, and so I went back and I rewrote it, went through it because I wanted it to be easy to read. I wanted it to be palatable. I wanted it to be to be able to take lofty truth and make, you know, place it in front of anybody and have them say, I understand now what this means. You know, there's a key word that you use there, which is truth, right? And I think part of why I started this podcast and why I want to have conversations with interesting people like you is because I'm trying to figure out what is the truth, right? Because in this world that we live in, there's so many different doctrines and dogmas and different um, rituals that people subscribe to that to be their truth, right? Mm -hmm. And some people will say truth is subjective. Other people will say truth is objective. And sometimes it could lead to confusion, right? Mm -hmm. And the more I, I know, the more I'm learning, the less I feel like I know. And you know, it seems like you feel like you've arrived at some truth, right? Mm -hmm. Some level of truth when it comes to all of this. And I want to know, how would you 
what do you consider to be the truth, uh. especially when it comes to God and this this world that we're living in? Right. Well, I guess I'd start off by saying there is no there is no lasting peace without truth. And I think that's one of the reasons why the world is in the chaos that it's in is because of what you mentioned, this whole concept. I don't want to. I don't want to malign anyone, but this whole, I would call it an insane concept of my truth, um, which is, of course, basically denying the, the definition of the word. Truth, by definition, excludes. Truth, by its definition, holds a point and stays there no matter what anyone says about it. And so I'll maybe answer your question on two levels. The first one, I'm going to answer just with a straight up Christianese answer. Uh, and that is that uh, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Um, so I would say if, if people are in pursuit of truth, I would say you cannot, you have to um, revolve it around the person of Jesus. And I think that, that that maybe sounds like a weird oversimplification, but I actually think that it is the key that will unlock um, all sorts of freedom in your mind. And so there's on, on one hand, I would say that, but maybe in a more philosophical sense, uh, for those who are more bent that way, I would say that truth is the way things are. Um, truth is reality. And if it's reality, it's the truth. And if it's not reality, it is not the truth. And I think this is basically held up on the most basic premise of, you know, uh, this is a pencil, right? Um, that is the truth. You know, um, now somebody else might call it something else, but that doesn't negate the fact that this is a pencil. Now, I may I may use it for other things, but but um, it is it is in fact a pencil. That is, the universe, the whole population of the world can rage against that answer, but it doesn't change the fact this is a pencil. And ultimately, I would say that's what truth is. And so it's not there's in that sense, and so it's exclusionary. It's not a pen. Right. Um, it's not a pitchfork. I could maybe fashion several of them together to function as a pitchfork, but it would just still be a bunch of pencils put together as a pitchfork. And so truth is reality. Truth is the way things are. And um, I think that in a world where we have different perspectives, um, I think there's definitely room for a different perspective. You've probably seen that. Um, that meme or whatever it is where it shows there's like a nine on the on, written on the on the ground and there's people standing on the other sides of it and you know the one one side of it says it's a nine the person on the other side says it's a six right and and everyone's kind of like oh see like it's subjective right or it's kind of depends where you're standing well it's it's an interesting little kind of meme but the truth of the matter is we have to ask the person who wrote it because it's either a nine or a six someone wrote it down and they meant it to be a nine or a six Right. And so um, I think that's ultimately also when it comes to truth, we have to say um, in the grander scheme of things, um, God is ultimately the definer of reality and the maker of reality. So we need to ask him, what did you mean by this? Um, not, not how do I interpret it? And I would say that, I mean, that's basically just good hermeneutics when it comes to the study of ancient texts and understanding the scripture. We don't ask the question, what does this mean to me? Or how do I interpret this? We say, what did the author intend to say? And then that is the truth. That is reality. It's interesting. I, I have a couple of comments to make from what you just said. But just really quickly to your point about we have to ask God what he meant by certain things that we see in this world. When we get that answer, how do we know it's God? That's right. talking to us. Right. Well, first, I would say it has to do with, um, is it from the scriptures? And this, of course, is a whole other, another topic um, about the inerrancy of scripture, um, which I which I believe in and subscribe to. But um, ultimately, it would come down to, okay, so I'm just trying to remember the words. I'm going to go way back in my mind to um, to uh, hermeneutics class, right? Um where it talks about whenever you're looking for truth or in this specific case, trying to interpret something that you're 
that has been said or that you're reading or just been said in general. Actually, let me take it away from the scripture and say a simple thing. You may say, um, um, it's dark outside, Corey. Okay, now I, I hear you, right? And I understand what the word dark means and I understand what the word outside means, right? So that is one level of understanding. I understand the words that you said, right? But then the next layer of of truly trying to find out the truth of something is to say, <clears throat> okay, I understand the words that you're saying. Um, why did you put them together in the way that you did, right? It's dark outside. Corey, I have to say, um, what did you mean by saying that? And of course, what you meant was to communi communicate to me that it was dark outside. Um, so I understand the words, and I now understand that you are communicating to me that it's dark outside. And there's a third layer. What did you intend for me to do with this information, right? And so I have to maybe, in that case, zoom it back and take in a greater context and say, oh, in the greater context of things, I had said that I was going to go for a run. And you told me, Corey, it's dark outside, right? So what your intention was was to somehow make me aware of the danger or the situation or whatever it was. Um, and so now I have a greater understanding. It's not just the words I understood. It's not just kind of the flow of them together, but I understand that you were actually trying to do something with those words. You were trying to communicate something to me. So when it comes to understanding God, right, that those same principles apply. You know, when the scripture says, um, I already used a scripture already, right? Um, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Well, I know what the word I means because I, you know, I'm an English speaker in this particular sense and truth is debatable. Do we know what truth is? I don't know. That's a, in today's world, it's a tricky one. The way, okay, he's talking about the direction and the life. There's, there's some vague words in there, right? But Jesus ran all these words together and he communicated them for the purpose of something happening, right? And that purpose of something happening was to tell me, in a sense, there's all these other answers in the world. Everyone's going to say, look to me for the truth. Look to me for the way. Someone else over there is going to say, look to me to find life in. But Jesus says, no, no, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And I tell this to you so that your pursuit of peace, your pursuit of happiness, your pursuit of joy can be experienced sooner without having to search the world and go through a bunch of heartache. And so as far as hearing God and knowing it's God, first off, I would say, um, is it in God's word? Because if God, I believe, communicates primarily through two means, creation, in which he says, I'm here, folks, <laughs> right? These, these stars didn't get here by themselves. Your whole idea of evolution, you know, is, um, is not science. It is, it is a mad grasp at something. Like the, it's, it's, a, it's very interesting how this is so taught in schools, and yet when you break it down, the most simplistic questions tear it all apart. It makes no sense, right? Um, the most basic idea, oh, we were, I'm, I'm rambling here, but we're a single-celled organism. You know, and suddenly that turned into a frog. And then that frog, you know, turned into a fish, or other around, turned into a fish, turned into a frog, and it turned into a you know, some little creepy crawly, and then it turned into a monkey. It's like, well, then why are there still fish? Why are there still frogs? Why are there still creepy crawlies? Why are there still monkeys? <laughs> you know, it's it's the whole idea, just in the basic comment of logic, right? It's like, oh, we evolved from monkeys, except for the monkeys who didn't. <laughs> and you're like, what? Anyway, my, my whole point is, it makes no sense. So God says in creation, I'm here. The most logical, the most scientific idea is that there was a creator that started all this. There was a mastermind who put this masterpiece together and then through his word. And what does he have to say? And so I'd say those two things are how you know that you're hearing from God. Is it consistent with God's, with creation? In which case you can use science. Um, and then is it consistent with what God has to say in his word? Which, by the way, God's word is a magnificent miracle in and of itself. To think of dozens upon dozens of authors spanning over 1,800 years, three different languages, completely different cultures, writing a book that melds together in perfect unity, it's, it's impossible unless it's divine. Thank you for sharing that perspective. My perspective on the truth, I think there's so many layers to the truth, right? I think in the world that we live in, there's a collective truth that we kind of all agree on, right? There was a certain point in time where 
it was okay for people to get married at like 12 or 13, right? Um, young women getting married to older men or older people. And that wasn't considered wrong, right? Now in modern times, we've agreed on a collective truth that that's wrong. But if you go back hundreds or thousands of years ago, that wasn't necessarily considered to be a wrong thing, right? Mm -hmm. Um, So that's one layer of the truth. Another layer of the truth, and I'm not, I can't define all the different layers. This is just kind of how I've been thinking about it. To your point about the perspective, the range of perception that we all have, right? Like you could have a six, someone could write a nine and depending on where they're standing, it could look like a six from someone else's perspective. And when I think about God, I think of God as this unconditional loving being. And when I think about other religions in the world that are not necessarily tied to Christianity, I think a lot of people choose ideas and um, scriptures or rituals that resonate with them as the truth, right? So, you know, I would say Christians resonate and connect with Jesus Christ as their truth, whereas someone who is Hindu or um, someone who was practiced Islam would connect to Muhammad, for example. Mm -hmm. So I've always kind of battled with that as to like, so who's right, Mm -hmm. right? Like is if you're saying you're the truth, this is the way to God. You're saying this is the way to Allah, for example, who is correct? Or are we all saying the same thing, but in a different Mm -hmm. way? Because that's another thing I'm realizing too, as I have numerous conversations with different people, some people will call the Holy Spirit that that force, that energy, that spirit, part of God. I don't know. God is a spirit mm-hmm. inherently, but you know what I'm trying to say. They mm-hmm. they will say the Holy Spirit spoke through me, and mm-hmm. then I talk to other people, and they talk about angels or spirit guides. And when I hear how they're describing it, I'm like, we're kind of all saying the same thing mm-hmm. in different ways, having different definitions. Even to your point with the pencil. Yeah, that looks like a pencil to a lot of people, but in a different language, they might have a different way of calling it a pencil and they might have, and they might use that pencil for something other than writing. So then does that change the fact that it's a pencil inherently, or you know what I'm trying to say? So for me, I think that truth is something that is not always easy to define doesn't mean that the truths that are being defined are not the truth either right Mm -hmm. I think it's a very convoluted topic Um, and to your point I think you said something that truth is exclusionary Mm -hmm. and that's the part too that I feel like when I kind of go into texts I struggle with the exclusion of Mm -hmm. of that because you know, I think a lot of, not always, but I think the idea of something being the truth blocks, could potentially block the understanding or willingness to kind of see a different perspective from someone else's angle, right? And that exclusionary piece, to me, sometimes could potentially lead to um, judgment, right? Which is something that people have struggled with you know, in the church sometimes, like, okay, it says according to scripture or some people's interpretation that this is considered a sin, Mm -hmm. but this is kind of who I am Mm. innately, right? Mm. So again, not to say that- Which is a bold claim. Sorry, go ahead. Which which is a bold claim to to claim that I am something innately. Like we want to be cautious with that, right? Mm. And um, and because it's a, um, again- you like you mentioned the, the pencil and different languages and, and different people using it for different things. And you're absolutely right. As I mentioned, you could fashion, fashion a bunch of these into a pitchfork. But when it comes down to identifying what is this is, what is this? We ask the question, well, what did the maker create it to be? And then that's what it is. And then we may use it for other purposes, right? But it it is in that sense a pencil because we the maker told us that's what he made it to be. Right. And we may have used it for something else and it will never work as good at something else as it will for its original use. 
you know, and that's, I think that's a big thing that expands over all sorts of human, you know, aspects of humanity, right? Where we use something that was intended for something different and we kind of make it work, but it was actually made for something better. And if we would use it for its original intent, it'd be that much more beautiful, right? Yeah. And the question I want to ask is that, so I believe we are constantly evolving and I'm not talking about on a biological level. Mm -hmm. I'm talking about on a spiritual level. Um, we're constantly evolving and mm -hmm. because we're constantly evolving, kind of like that explanation I gave you where, you know, for a while getting married at 12 or 13 wasn't a big deal, but now it's a lot of people would consider that to be absolutely atrocious and completely wrong. Mm -hmm. And because we continue to evolve in our thinking and in our spirit, it makes me want to ask you if you agree with that. And if so, does that mean that the truth potentially could be a moving target of what mm. we define the truth to be? That's a really great question. I guess the first thing I would say, first off, on your comment about made the age of marriage. I'd say there's a first a couple things to take into. I would say that number one, that isn't related to truth as much as that's related to ethic. So an evolving ethic, we could say, right? Um, and not only that, we have to take into consideration the fact that um, people died crazy young back then. Right? You know, I won't, I don't, I can't, you know, I, I don't know the numbers off the head, but people, there's a much shorter lifespan for a very long segment of time, right? And so in that particular sense, someone getting married at 13 years old and dying at 35, you know, when you think, when you take that metric, you say, okay, well, now they get married at 35 and we die at 80. You know, it's essentially the same blocks of time, right? But different culture, different lifespans due to different things, right? And so, and in that, there's also the reason for the ethic. And um, there's an old saying that says, before you move a fence, pause long enough to ask why it was put there in the first place, right? And so you're right, in our modern context, we can't conceive of, you know, I have a 13 year old son, can't conceive of him getting married. And uh, gosh, trying to look after a family, it's insane, right? But of course, different culture, different time, he would be a totally different person. Um, so there's that whole idea of things. But as far as evolving, I really love the way you think and the, and the questions that you're asking. I would say, first off, remember I started off saying that I believe we start as spiritual beings and it, with an with inherent spiritual understanding. And then over time, we get bogged down by the, I would say the blindness of this world and we become more and more self-deceived to where we suddenly think that all we are is a brain and a body. And we insist that we're a brain and a body, even though we're unhappy and miserable and have no peace. <laughs> um, and so when you say we're evolving, I think that, yeah, I think maybe in some ways we are, but I would say primarily we're devolving. I think evolving kind of sounds like we're moving towards something better. And and if that is, in fact, the definition of the word, then I would say that's the wrong word. Um, I would say that we are actually devolving. We are becoming a less happy society. We are, we are a people that is less and less at peace. Um, for all of our noble at least the heart intention of eradicating racism, we just seem to be growing racism. Like everything just seems to be getting, you know, the more freedom we have, the more unhappy we become. It's a weird metric. And yet I think it's it's almost undeniable when we look at the world around us, we are becoming a very unhappy people, a very combative people, a very isolated people. And so in that sense, I would say that culture is not evolving, it is devolving. Um, technology might be evolving, right? Uh, medical science might be evolving, but as a spe as a species, as a as a as a people, as a creature designed to live um a life of joy and purpose in connection with the divine, we've just devolved and we just continue to devolve. And that's why I wrote my book hopefully stop this this downward trend yeah and and keep us on the right path uh, mm -hmm. that's interesting i'm i actually have a, a a more uh 
optimistic perspective because you know there's this concept of having the, the dark night of the soul mm-hmm. um and then there's also the song that um there's always darkness before the dawn and mm-hmm. even though i feel like it seems that things are getting more and more out of hand i think things have always been out of hand because i think <laughs> human nature is to be a bit crazy, but I think we live in a world now where we can see every single thing happening around the world that's negative. And it's only the negative stuff that's pushed out to us, right? But when I have conversations with people, with strangers, there's this, I always find myself ending up in a conversation where I'm talking about God, I'm talking about the spirit, I'm talking about this this good energy or this good mm-hmm. source that's around us. So it makes me feel like a lot more people are actually getting more and more tapped in to the spirit and even conversations like this that we're having. It's so much now on the web, right? And although we get bombarded with a lot of the hate and vile nature of humanity, like we get shown the worst of the worst, I do think that most people are moving towards a more intentional, whether intentional or unintentional, I think people are being called to look a bit deeper and connect Mm -hmm. with that part of us that we we call the spirit, right? That Mm -hmm. that part of us that gets us closer to to God, Mm -hmm. to source, to to that thing that is unconditionally loving and 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 beautiful. so, but I also understand how I under, also understand your perspective as well as to why it feels like we're not getting any better when it comes to a lot of these things, when it comes to race or other like social issues that we have. It just seems like it continues to div- divide us. And mm-hmm. funny enough, religion continues to be one of the driving forces for a lot of mayhem in this world. Um And before I get into the part about your book, about the five cravings of the soul, because I do think talking about that will kind of allow us to understand a little bit these different motivations that people have that end up turning into more hate and aggression. Before I get into that, I I have to ask you before we move from the topic of truth, do you think that Christianity is the only way to God? Mm -hmm. Well, again, I would go back to a, a couple of things. Back to the verse I already mentioned, um, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And the verse ends by him saying, no one comes to the Father but through me. And so Jesus is saying this um, not only as, you know, the Savior, but as God himself, as a second member of the Trinity, right? Um, One God and three persons. Jesus is that second person, personality in the sense of the Trinity, right? Um, Um. and so I would say that, yes, in, but I would say, maybe put it in a different way. I would say that Christianity and Islam agree that there is only one God, um, and Judaism for that matter. The three agree that there's only one God. And th- they obviously have different ideas as to who this God is. And that's where the divergence comes, because they have a very different view of who God is. Um, I, I believe that I believe Jesus, um, when he said that he's the way, the truth and the life, no one comes to the father, but through him. But I also believe that, that Jesus inserts himself because of, because he is a relentlessly loving God, that he inserts himself on everybody's path. So this idea that, um, you're way over there, right. And unless you come way over here. You know, you'll never, you'll never get to meet God, right? I would say that the whole idea of scripture, you know, Jesus tells the parable of, of the shepherd leaving the 99 to go after the one, right? And I'd say that God does that for each one of us. So you're on your path. And um, Jesus, at some point, will insert himself into your path and say, hey, Jimmy, here I am. And the opportunity will be given um, to follow him or to go around him and continue on the path. And I think everybody has that opportunity. 
Um, and so I think that the world is in many different pursuits. They're all heading in many different directions. Uh, we can all be wrong, but we can't all be right. Um, and so when, especially when it comes to the, the, the context of faith. And so I believe that, yes, Jesus is the only way to heaven, but that Jesus, because of his love, inserts himself in your path, even if you're heading in the completely opposite direction. And that he doesn't just do it once, but that he does it constantly and consistently. You know, and maybe, maybe it's in a moment of you see a sunset and it just hits you, the power and the beauty of creation. And you're just in awe that an artist clearly put this together. And in your mind, it's like, who is this artist? And it's like Jesus just inserted himself and said, come over here, right? Or maybe you're in the midst of deep trauma and hurt and pain. And Jesus inserts himself and says, I'm the comforter. I will never leave you or forsake you. And you have that opportunity to follow or not to follow, right? That is ultimately another fundamental truth of Christianity is you have the you have the choice. Now, I will be perfectly frank that I believe that there's a good choice and a bad choice, um, but you have the choice. And I'm not going to go to war or to have any do any violence against you to try to get to you to believe my particular viewpoint, right? Um, and so I believe that, yeah, Jesus is the only way. Um to uh to the father um but that he doesn't say that in like a flicking his nose at you kind of way he says that this is a reality again when it comes to truth and reality this is the reality i i am a god who loves you i created you to live in connection um jesus says cast all your cares upon me and i will give you rest He's, he's the God who wants to give you peace, insert peace into any situation. And so, yeah, the only way to get to the Father is through him. But the good news is he's in pursuit of you, even when you're not in pursuit of him. It's, it's yeah, that's interesting. Um, I, I grew up Catholic, so mm -hmm. I'm, you know, in my family, different denominations, Baptist, um, a couple other denominations, Protestant all of that stuff. So, and I went to, um, a Catholic school pretty much up until college. I went to Jesuit college as well. So, um, yeah, so I'm, I, I'm very familiar with, with Jesus Christ and his teachings. And, um, I connect with Jesus Christ a lot. I think for me, I just question my thing is, how much of this is God and how much of this are, is our people imposing human characteristics mm. and desires onto God? Cause the idea, yeah. Yes. Cause the idea of this, I think of God as this grand being, right? Some people say the universe some people say source, I'm going to use God in this context, mm -hmm. right? Think of God as this grand being all knowing he's, he knows the future uh, he knows the past. He he knows the beginning and end. Everything he knows, he knows exactly that you and I were going to have this conversation today on this date. Mm -hmm. And um, I just think with such a grand being, why would they care if we believed in them? Why do we need an intercessor to? be able to connect with them because mm -hmm. when I think about and this is not an apples to apples comparison but when I think about my parents you know creating me their their cells coming together to create me even if I didn't talk to them like I grow up and I decide not to talk to them right their blood is in in me their DNA is in me right I whether or not I acknowledge them or not I am forever connected to them, right? Mm -hmm. And when I think about being a parent myself, I think about this idea of unconditional love. Like, even if, you know, God forbid, I had a child that they they and I didn't see eye to eye, mm -hmm. my door will always be open for them, whether or not they acknowledge me or go through a certain path, right? And mm -hmm. then I think about people who live really good lives, but maybe they just don't 
practice the doctrine, for example, or they don't mm-hmm. really connect with Jesus, but they live a life filled with so much love. Mm-hmm. And I would think to myself, if they didn't call on Jesus or they didn't go through the p- path of connecting with Christ to connect to God, and if there was a heaven, those people would be shut out. Cause that, mm-hmm. So then that's what makes me kind of slightly pause on mm-hmm how much of this is God and how much of this is human beings creating God in their image, right? Because I'll hear a lot of people say, you have to call on God, you have to acknowledge God. And I was like, but that's so ego driven. You know what I mean? That's so like, that's so ego driven. And I, I can't imagine a God that would have the characteristics that we have and maybe god does we i don't think we'll ever know god until we transition from this world right Mm -hmm. but those are the things that my mind goes to and those are the questions that i'm constantly on a hunt Mm -hmm. to answer because that disconnection to me it, it just doesn't make sense well, if I could give you kind of what I just I love I love your whole your whole thought process in the midst of all this. And I, I don't know why I'm gonna keep coming back to this pencil. But the um I guess I put it this way, as much as like said, your parents created you, you know, intentionally or unintentionally, I don't know the story. Um, you know, and you you came into existence, God created you with much more intention. And that is the that is the amazing and beautiful thing. When the scripture says that we are created in God's image, ultimately what that means is a whole lot of you know rabbit trails we could go down with that. But ultimately, to bring it back, what it ultimately means is we were made to live in connection with God. You just think of that for a moment. You think that God cre- God just didn't create some creature and say, buzz off, roam the earth. He created us to live in connection with him. There's a place in the New Testament where the Apostle Paul says in him, talking about God, we live and move and have our being. In, in, the, in that sense, because we were created to live in connection with God, we never can experience full peace and happiness. And all you have to do is look at the world as, it, as it's 100% testimony to this. We can... We can never live in that place of peace and happiness without living in connection with him. We can have moments. Oh, we can have short seasons where everything seems right with the world or where we feel like we're a good person. There's a whole new concept with that. What is good? Who defines it? Um, But the idea, I guess I would say, is that God created you to live in connection with him. It is a mind-blowing, wonderful thing. But you specifically, he says, Jumi, I have designed you to live in connection with the divine. That is not just your right. That is your design. And you may run to wealth, or I, you know, I'll stop using you as an example. I'll use myself as an example. I may run to wealth. I'm not going to find it there, for, but for a short season. I may immerse myself in sexual pursuit, which is what so much of the world is doing now. It's never enough. It doesn't bring happiness. In fact, ultimately, often it brings destruction, Right. Um, and so you're right in the sense that, or you're right to be cautious in the sense that because we are fallen human beings, there are plenty of people who will use God for their own purposes. Now, God won't let them get away with it for very long, right? But that is ultimate, the ultimate way to control people, right? And that's why I say you have to go to God's word. What is the, what is, what does the Bible say? Because I might say to you, oh, Jumi, unless you write me a check, um, right, you're, you're not good with God. And there are plenty of people across the world who have abused uh, other individuals in that very way, right? There Now, there's no, that's not what the Bible has to say. I'll tell you that. Um, and so God has often been used, but that's that's the interesting part about free will, right? So God created you to live in connection with him. That's your design. You won't, I am a firm believer, you will not find lasting happiness without connecting with him. Um, however, he's also given you free will. He's also said, you're going to do your thing. And he's going to keep inserting himself and keep calling to you, even if you're running down the wrong paths, but he's going to let you do your thing. God's not to blame for the chaos that's in the world today. God's told us how to live in peace and harmony and goodness. Um, but we're all going on our own way. And then you brought up hell, 
for a moment, or those who are, live a good life. First off, I think those are obviously uh, it's a hypothetical person, um, and or because you know how it is, you it's like looking at Facebook, right? Everyone's got this perfect life on Facebook. Eh, actually, get into their life, and you'll see it's not so uh, not so good. We're all the same way, right? We all have our stuff, and we all have our rebellions, and um, and so God doesn't send you to hell so much as we choose it. Um, in the sense that God has said, um, here's where I am and here's where heaven will be. And we, we choose to go to the alternate place, right? Ultimately, hell is, I often say, put it this way, hell is the absence of God. And where you have the absence of God, because right now we live in a world that even though it largely denies him, he's still in pursuit of us. There's still time on the clock. He's still calling to us. He's saying, still come here. He's still sending, you mentioned, whether we're talking about the angels or the Holy Spirit or whatever topic, into the world to try to, he's given us free will, but there's all these kind of actors out there, holy actors, trying to stand up for good and pull us towards truth. But the day will come at the end where that stops. Like he has said, there's a day coming where, where I will withdraw myself from those who have shown they don't want anything to do with me. Because they think they got it all to themselves. And so ultimately, hell is not a, a place where God placed fire and placed evil. And he says, oh, you did not believe in the name of Jesus? Your punishment is hell. No, hell is the absence of God. You didn't want to follow God. You didn't want to be with God. You now end up in this place where when, the ab when, when God is fully removed, fire, gnashing of teeth, agony, that will be the result, not because God made it, but because we made it in his absence you know it's interesting you brought up free will because i was going to ask them you know like what is the purpose of free will um and i think everything that you're saying i think for me it just like brings a thousand more questions personally mm -hmm. but that's just how my brain works right and i think good um and we don't have to get into all of the questions but some of the things that pop into my mind are just like okay well then what what was the point of giving us free will to do all this work to bring us back to you because there is no love without free will right I, yeah yeah that's true there's no love without free will but then if if god knows everything then god knows who's going to end up back with him mm. do you know yeah. what i mean so yeah and so mm -hmm. you're right in the sense that god is not bound by time so um he it's like he has one foot in the past and one foot in eternity so to him, it's all the past, the present, the future. That he, there's no time in his in time is is what we have, right? It's not what he has. So it would be wrong. But there, there's a I would say there's a concept out there that maybe has some truth to it, but primarily it's not true in the sense that where it's like, okay, God, God chose you to go to heaven and he chose you not to, right? Like that whole idea. I think there's a concept there that is is kind of tough and we have to flesh it out with the scripture. But the general truth is that no, that's not the way God works. God, because God is timeless, he's, he, he knows what decisions you made. Right. right. Yeah. So that's the thing that like, you know, gets me, I, I will say the closest thing, cause I, I'm of the belief that, um, different religions kind of like how we have different languages and certain words in different languages don't translate directly from English to whatever language I kind of feel like is the same thing similarly to, religion and spiritual practices i kind of think i don't think christianity is the only way to god mm -hmm. so i i'm very open to listening to different perspectives and the one perspective that i've come across that kind of makes more sense to me mm -hmm. is the notion of reincarnation mm. when we talk about reincarnation and the fact that as souls we're here to learn and you know evolve ultimately we're finding our way back to that ultimate goodness which is god mm -hmm. but we are given multiple lives to mm -hmm. try to be better people right and that mm -hmm. the law of karma because you know the world is governed by different um are laws, you referring to right? this in a buddhist sense or in a hindu sense because it's very different because I, I think in the hindu sense you're they have this idea. I like the, I like that you called it a notion of reincarnation. 
because there is zero evidence, both logical or scientific, to to back it up. So it is it is a notion, is what I would say, right? And it's I very much understand the, the kind of the comforting concept of it, but it's like there's zero evidence to it. So I would say it's a notion. But the difference also is because in Hinduism, people are reincarnated until they finally are released into the cosmic to become one with the universe, right? Whereas in Buddhism, I often call Buddhism atheist by atheism by works, in the sense that you're evolved, you know, you're reincarnated until you finally reach a point of nothingness. Right. And so Buddhism leads you to nothingness. Hinduism, the concept that leads you to being one with the universe. So they're very they're very opposite in that sense. So do you have a in your own feelings a specific one that you're you think you find comfort in? So that's a great question. So I am still working through that because with Hinduism, there's this idea that you keep coming back until you make the right choices. So to me also, that feels like you're trapped in something, right? right? But Which, this seems impossible in the sense that if, like, like you said, in an, if the world is evolving, right. And we're eth because ethic is moving, you know, the right choices again, how, where are we, def where are we getting our definition of right? Um, because as you mentioned, once upon a night, it, it was right to persecute an individual for a specific action. Today we say, oh no, that's wrong, right? And we could, there's a million examples we could use of that, right? So even, it, that could even happen in a generation. So what's right in one particular, let's, let, let's pretend that that um, the law of karma, right? Or is a, is an, is a thing, right? To, to get it kind of almost right in this life and then have the next one where the moral code has totally shifted. You really didn't learn anything. You're you're doing it again, right? Anyway, I don't. I don't. Sorry, I don't mean to tear it down. I just, no, no. I've thought about it a lot, right? And for, so for me, one of the things about Christianity, if I could kind of just insert it in there, Christianity. This is one of the reasons I'm a Christian, to be honest. Is the only faith on the face of the planet um, that is verifiable scientifically, um, historically. Um, we know Jesus existed. We know he was crucified on a cross, not just because the Bible tells us, but because the uh, Roman texts tell us, right? Along with uh, other Jewish texts. Oh, there's always these things where the Old Testament talks about a specific king who existed at a specific time and everyone's like, there's no history of that. Then sure enough, it happens all the time over the last several hundred years. They, they unearth a rock where it's like, oh yeah, look, there's a writing on it that talks about this city. We didn't know it existed. Oh, but the Bible talked about it way back then. In, in that sense, like Christianity is the only faith that is verifiably mathematically, scientifically, historically, you know, on and on we could go. Mm -hmm. But sorry. Yeah, that's a good that's a good point. I I think to your first question about like why I called it a notion is because like you said we can never on paper prove this. But I I have listened to countless near death experiences. And also there are many numerous stories of children who remember their past life and they will give like historically accurate um, information about who they were and people mm -hmm. can actually look them up and be like, wow, that's oddly specific and they're not in the same family. And even, you know, being very transparent in my own personal experience, I've had, I've had things happen that make me question a lot of things. So for example, I've had numerous dreams that appear to be more like flashbacks rather than dreaming because it was within a specific time period. I'm in a different body. It was, it was weird. Now I can't say categorically, oh, that was me having flashbacks to a past life. Uh -huh. But I, one thing about me is I don't, I don't, put a limit on the possibility of what reality is. So, you know, and to your question about like where I've landed on reincarnation, I don't know. I'm still doing more research into, do I believe that we're kind of stuck in this karmic loop where we keep coming back and coming back and coming back until we're worthy enough to, you know, connect with God? Um or are we re like coming back and coming back in order to connect to nothingness? And my understanding of nothingness is not being tied down by the shackles of being in a physical body, having to work to eat um, mm -hmm. or work to live or have all of these like desires that end up leading us nowhere. So that's my idea of nothingness. So I, I will say maybe I'm closer to the Buddhist interpretation mm -hmm. of karma, but 
I'm sorry, of reincarnation, but reincarnation is is one of the concepts I've come across that seem to kind of answer a little bit mm -hmm. of my question as to this whole like purpose and journey to God. Is it really the, oh, you have to go through God to get to heaven? Or is it more about us being souls, having a human experience intentionally in order to evolve our souls even more. I haven't I saw, arrived at an answer, yeah. but that's where I am at the moment. The reason I'm I'm talking so much about it is because I've thought about reincarnation a lot. And mm -hmm. I agree that it, I agree that it's a fun concept. And so but but me being my analytical, philosophical, psychological mind, you know, um delving into it, I, there's a couple of things. So first off, Buddhism um the, it's the the original teaching of it is that it is nothing it's it's non-existence so there there is a definition to it in that sense that it's it's working towards non-existence that's why i call it atheism by works you know because in modern day atheism you die and you, there's just nothing right but in buddhism you have to work really hard and be a good person and go from you know life to life to earn your nothingness it's a it's kind of an interesting concept um but one of the reasons um psychologically where i think that why i think that um, there's such a pull towards this concept of reincarnation. It's often like, so if I'm dealing, um, uh, I'm a transformational coach and a counselor and um, have sessions with people and walk through pe with people through a lot of stuff. And um, one of the things that I'll I'll discover is that when I, if I'm counseling or, or giving therapy to someone who has just gone through um, divorce um, or some big loss, in the moment, all you can see is what you've lost, right? And so there's this pain at as what has at what has been lost. What we can't see is what's coming. You know, to a certain degree, it's like realize that a door has closed, and it hurts because I know what was behind that door, and that hurt is oftentimes more real to me than the, the realization that there's another door that's going to open, and the chances are there's going to be something good behind it. And so I'm often trying to get my clients to realize that not only, yes, there's a door that's closed and and there's grief with that, but I want you to know that there is a good thing. We don't know what it is yet. We don't know, but there is a good thing behind this next door. And I think there's a similar concept when it comes to reincarnation. And the reason I think that, that it even developed is, is this ability in ourselves because we don't, we can't conceive of what's coming next. All we know is what was. And so it is our psychological way of simply, sorry, of simply repeating what we know mm -hmm. because we can't conceive or we're fearful of the unknown, mm -hmm. right? And so we, we can't embrace the unknown. And so we instead just kind of um, build our, up ourselves the notion of a repeated familiar. Mm -hmm. But that would be my psychological kind of analysis of it. Interesting. I've never thought about it that way. That that just like opened my mind up a little bit because I used to think that, you know, with a lot of religious dogma, I thought it was very fear mongering. I think mm -hmm. at, the, at the core of hu our human experience, we want something that we can hold on to mm -hmm. that gives us a sense of security. Right. And I think yeah. religion spirituality gives us a sense of security like okay i'm not just living this human experience and going through these difficult things for nothing i'm being promised of a promised land once i transition from this world potentially and some people would even say that the closer you are to god you can start you know living in this promised land here on earth right people have different interpretations so i i get it and i Mm. that's part of what has always drawn me to it because I've always, I'm looking for a sense of security as well. Like what, what is this for? Because we know that the human experience can be very challenging. So I used mm. to actually think that a lot of religious ideologies were more fear mongering because I thought if people knew that, or if reincarnation was actually really a thing, I don't think people would be running into the streets trying to, um, do whatever they want to do, right? Because I do think with with Christianity and, and going with Jesus and even with reincarnation, the incentive there is to live a good life regardless, right? It's just different paths because if you're not living well, so a good I, life- I mm -hmm. would argue with you big time on that one because Christianity though. 
Because I, I, I mm. guess that my point would be with Christianity, I would say the, it's kind of the opposite almost. That is the, the, the fundamental purpose of Christianity is God saying to us, you can't be good enough. You've proven it. You know, I, I told you what was right. I told you what was good. Right from the very beginning in the Garden of Eden, you walked away and did your own thing. Right. And so the answer in Jesus is saying, you know what? You can't do this. So God says, let me do it for you. And that is ultimately, the, again, another difference between Hinduism, Buddhism, Islam, for that matter, and Christianity, where these other faiths are saying, be good enough. Right. And then maybe there's this chance that you'll have contact with the divine. Christianity says you can't be good enough but God loved you enough to do it for you. And so embracing Christ isn't saying, okay, now I'm going to live this perfect Christ life, though the God God wants us to now, out of gratitude, live a good life. It's us acknowledging, no, I'm a sinner. I can't do this. But God loved me enough to make a way where there was no way. Mm, that is a good point. But again, my brain is like the idea of being inherently not good enough mm. is also something that like, I think Humbling. causes a lot of mental issues for people. And mm -hmm. even to the point of like other practices saying you're not good enough, be good enough. Even that too, to me yeah. is like, but that's, I, I think that, I think there'd be a misconception know. there. Maybe I'm verbalizing it wrong because think about this. Mm -hmm. It's not, it's not God saying you're not good enough. It's in like, ah, you're not good enough, Jimmy. It's God saying, acknowledging that his standard is high. To a certain degree, it's a divine standard. Um, and so, but it's God saying, my standard is high. And because I am a God who is perfect in love and perfect in goodness, that cannot change. That is the, that is the standard. Um, but I love you enough, Jimmy, that I will die on a freaking cross to make sure that it is now, it is now the life of Jesus that meets the bar on your behalf and not yours, right? And so the, ultimately, the, the promise of Christ is not one that says, you're not good enough, nah, 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 right? It's, it's, it's acknowledging the bar is high. We can't reach it, but God loves you enough to not just, I mean, it, it sounds so clean and pretty to say, oh, but God, you know, did for you what you couldn't do for yourself, but to say, no, that God the God of the universe took on flesh, submitted himself to be abused and spit on and beat to the point of death to die the most humiliating possible mockery of a death. And he did it for you. Question. Mm -hmm. Do you think that, because we talk about sin, right? Sin is a big thing that we talk about in Christianity. Do you think that part of sin is not calling on Jesus or accepting Jesus into your life in order to connect with God. And the reason I ask that is because something I've struggled with understanding is that when I have conversations sometimes about the concept of sin and um, straying away from God, I'm always like, if Jesus came to die for our sins, then automatically that doesn't mean keep sinning and you know no accountability that's not what i'm talking yeah. about necessarily but if he came to die for our sins he he's he's come to take the ultimate punishment for our sins then doesn't that mean automatically that god is no longer counting our sins against us whether or not we accept jesus christ or not because right. he has already come and done the hard work for us right. And that ultimately is the point of evangelism. So I'd say no in the sense that, so yes, Jesus did this work on your behalf. And now what he calls you to do is to believe, right? If you look at the Old Testament, the Old Testament was said, behave. <laughs> it said you had to meet this bar. And if you don't meet this bar, God is not pleased with you, right? New Testament says, um, believe. Old Testament, behave. New Testament believe. And so here, I guess here's where I would put it this way. So you, you talked earlier about God being an unconditionally loving being, having unconditional love. 100% right. However, here's where I would say even people in the church today have got it wrong. 
John 3, 16, probably the most famous scripture in all the world. Uh, in almost every religion can quote it. <laughs> you know, it's so familiar, right? For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. Starts off, for God so loved the world, unconditional love. He loved us right where we're at. The infuriating part for some people is he loves everybody, even the people you hate. God loves them. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, right? So Christ died, came to die for the world, that whosoever. That's where the bottleneck happens, right? Now it's like, okay, it's he's saying, if you want access now, to this life that I've given you through the work of Christ Jesus, whosoever believeth in him. Now, what does it mean to believe in Jesus? Probably the most important question in the history of the world, I think. <laughs> and I think a lot of people have gotten it wrong. And so if, if you take all the scriptures together, it doesn't mean that I believe he existed. You know, it's, it's more than that. Um, it doesn't mean that I believe he died and rose again. It's actually more than that. If you bring all the scriptures together to believe in Jesus, it means we believe in his physical work that he did. We believe in his person. That is, we believe who he said he was because Jesus very clearly claimed to be God dying on our behalf, right? We believe in the, in the person, the work, and the teaching of Jesus. Now Jesus says to you, go love the world. Jesus says to you, um, confess your sins. And so the way to access God's grace is to agree with him with what sin is. Because Jesus says, you don't get this if you don't even agree with me that you're doing wrong. You have to agree with me that this is sin. And when you can agree with me that this is sin, and when you confess it to me, it's gone. Never happened. And and so I, I that's the that's the sticker point, I guess. Yes, he died for everybody, but we can never confuse God's love with God's grace. His grace, his love is unconditional. His grace comes upon the condition of belief. I'm going to think about that a little bit more because I still struggle with the conditional part. Um, I, I do think Jesus came to show us how to live uh -huh. uh, what people would consider a righteous life, a life yep. that's loving. Um, we know. And don't Jesus, get me wrong. He wants you to do that. Yes. But, but you're never going to be able to do it to the point where God's like, oh, I didn't have to die for you. You're perfect. <laughs> right. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, we're never going to get to that point, right? But absolutely. But now our response, now my goodness, isn't out of a fear, isn't out of like, oh my gosh, I have to be good or I'm not going to get to heaven. No, my goodness is now out of gratitude. It's not based on fear. It's based on gratitude. Mm. It's interesting that you said that because I, I think, especially about the part about um, we can't be like Jesus himself. But I actually think that that's what Jesus was trying to teach us, that we could be like him if we open our hearts and accept the people that society tells us not to accept for example whether we understand them or not right we are loving we are you know and we're, i think we're definitely called to mimic our father in that sense mm -hmm. right um and because yeah god says um, as i have loved so you love as i have been merciful be merciful there's no doubt he calls us to those actions but now we do those actions not because if we don't, he's going to curse us and send us to hell. We do them because um, when you love someone for what they've done for you, you respond in an appropriate way. And so now our, our love and our healing towards the world is because we now, because we love God, we now view the world more and more through his eyes and not our own, mm -hmm. right? And in, in our eyes, we're constantly judging everyone, constantly dividing everyone due to their education, their weight, their ethnicity, whatever it is, God doesn't like that. He just sees a soul, right? And um, ultimately, going back to the topic of the soul, that ultimately is why I, I believe not only is it the core of who we are, but when we start living life soul first, it washes away everything that divides us. Because when it comes to the soul, we're all the same. Yes, uh, that was a perfect segue into the soul because I do want to ask this question. I know that we've we ended up going on a, a completely different rabbit hole, which I absolutely loved. But I think that there's something powerful. There's a powerful insight that you impart on us, you know, through your book, which is the five cravings of the soul. And I kind of just wanted to touch on that a little bit. You say that the the five cravings, and, and let me know if I'm wrong, are security, identity, independence, significance, and innocence. 
why do you believe those are the five cravings of the soul? And, and why do you think right. it's important for us to understand that that's really what we're craving at our core? Right. Well, first off, I guess I would say that those five cravings are the root of all human ambition. Everything that has ever happened in the history of mankind happened in the pursuit of one of those five cravings, security, identity, independence, significance, innocence. And the reason I call them soul cravings um, is because they are deeper than psychology. They are provenly deeper than psychology. And I'll, I'll just break them apart quickly for you a moment. So security, I, I will split this into two parts. Number one, we're looking for physical security, right? Which the scientific world would call our will to live, which is very strong. But we're not just looking for physical security, we're looking for relational security. And that is to say, we need to know that our hearts are safe in the hands of those who hold them. And the vast majority of our heartache in the world is when we discover that our hearts were not safe in the hands of those who held them. And so we are desperate for not just physical security, but relational security. And then identity. Again, a completely non-biological craving. From a biological sense, it's counterproductive. It's pointless, right? But when it comes to the soul, it is an absolute must. I would say identity asks four symbiotic questions. Who am I? Why am I? Do I have value? Do I have purpose? And you can have all the security in the world, but if you don't know who you are or whether there's value to you, you won't have peace. It's not going to happen. And then, of course, there's what I call independence. Um, and independence, I again break into two parts. There's the one part of it that's the part that demands freedom, right? Um, remember the words of William Wallace, right? you may take our lives, but you will never take our freedom. There is within us this innate desire to be free, to have autonomy of some kind. It doesn't need to be complete, but we cannot have peace. We cannot have happiness unless we sense that we are in some way free. And that's why I, I, I say in the book, I said, if, I said, if you take away people, any right to autonomy, you will have a revolution on your hands. People will not accept um, they'll accept you taking away a lot of freedom, but they will demand something. They need some way to feel free. But it's not just about freedom. It's also about individuality when it comes to independence. So that is to say, I need, I am aware and I need to have it understood that I am an individual. It's like, on one hand, with identity, I want to kind of be associated with a collective, but not at the expense of individuality. In some way saying, I am distinct. You know, we are, I'm different from you and I need that to be celebrated, right? So security, identity, independence, significance. We all need to know that we're not just distinct, but that we're special, that there's something about us that we contribute that no one else can contribute because we're special. And for some people, it's like, it just, it's as simple as I, I make the best apple pie, right? And for someone else, right? Usain Bolt, he's the fastest man who ever ran the hundred meter dash. Right. And the, when the day comes that that record is broken, I suspect he's going to take a massive punch to his significance and probably his identity. Right. And um, so we all looking for significance of some kind again. And we look at it in, in different ways. For some people, it's like they do not feel significant unless, you know, they have 10 million in the bank account and they are singing to sold out concert venues. For other people, it's just like, you know what? my grandma is the favorite person to go on walks with, or I think that I'm my grandma's favorite. Right. And it doesn't, it's there. We're both there. Both people are pursuing significance, but they're just finding satisfaction in different places. And then there's innocence. And that is to say that we all need to know that we are not guilty <laughs> and not only not guilty, but whether you, whether it's kind of a merging of, of um, innocence with significance or whether it's, it's just own distinct nature we want to be so innocent that we are in fact righteous. And I, I'll often say this, basically every argument you've ever had, you've probably heard me say this before, or any offense you've ever taken happened because you sensed that someone was accusing you of wrongdoing or wrong thinking. And we as human beings cannot accept that feeling of guilt. And so we do one of two things generally. We either um, run away because we can't be around someone who makes us feel guilty. Right. Talk about a major part in the breakup of, of, of marriage or relationship, right? When you're always accusing your partner, man, it's just a matter of time until they leave because we can't, we can't bear up under that. Right. So we either run away or 
we fight and what I call the righteousness wars begins, right? Because I don't need, I know that I'm not completely innocent. None of us are, but I just need to know I'm more innocent than you. So you, you'll you say to me, Corey, you left your socks on the floor again. And my general response is going to be, oh yeah? Well, you left the kitchen a mess. <laughs> you know, ultimately I'm trying to say, I'm trying to say, hey, I am, I'm more innocent than you, right? Almost every argument we've ever had, the whole rise of cancel culture, I would say, has developed from this misguided pursuit of the craving of innocence. And the reason I call my book The Magnetic Heart of God, Understanding the Five Cravings of Your Soul, is because I believe that God placed these cravings inside us on purpose and for the purpose of drawing us back to him. Because at the end of the day, um, there's no security like the security found in God. He is the only one that is reliable and faithful. Um, because we are made in the image of God, he is the very source of our identity. And he is the one that has placed our value upon us, a value of complete worth. Um, th then when you get to independence, I often talk about think about this. When, when If you go back to the Genesis account, it says that God told Adam to name the animals of the earth, and whatever he named them, that's what they were. God wasn't micromanaging anyone. He said, go, steward the earth, right? And he set us free. Now, the interesting part of this, God, if you read the chapter on uh, independence in my book, I talk about how God placed boundaries on that independence for the purpose of keeping us safe because we're by nature self-destructive. So any every time God says, thou shalt not, it's with love written all over it. Is God is saying, I want the best for you. Don't go there because that will not result in what's best for you. And then, of course, significance. There's no greater sense of significance than found in, in the depths of God's love and the realizing of the, the distance he went to make a way for us. And then, of course, innocence is the same thing. I'm guilty. We're all guilty. But Jesus sent his son to declare us innocent. Mm. And so, but the problem is just like in the garden of Eden, we took off and did our own thing and we're doing the same thing now. So this is also, I attach it to sin. So sin is ultimately all the places that we try to, these cravings were, were designed to be met in within our maker in connection with our maker. Sin is ultimately when we try to connect them to other things. Right. And so ultimately what takes place is I'm like, you know what? I'm going to take my security in my money. Right. Ultimately, God's going to say, ooh, that's, that's bad for you. That's not, that's not what's good for you. You're not going to find happiness. That's missing the mark, which, which is what sin means, right? Missing the mark. Um, and I want something better for you than that, right? We say, you know, we're like, we, we, in our modern day world today, it's like we find identity in unhealthy places, places that were never meant to be an identity, right? Um, and yet we, we, divide ourselves on rage on, on sorry on race we divide ourselves on sexuality we just divide ourselves on you know income and education and all the stupid ways that we as a human race find to divide ourselves right um and yet um god has said you find your identity in me and you're all my children and if we would just grasp that concept and if Miss America goes up on the stage and wants world peace, that's where we're going to start, right? And um, you go through all of them, right? They're designed to be met in God. We're like, I'm going to find my significance in, you know, some people, I'm going to find my significance in being the best. A few people do that. That's actually not too bad. But you know what most of us do? I'm going to find my significance in making you feel small. It's a manufactured significance, Right. But I don't want to put in the work to get like truly significant. So instead, I just belittle and demean and dehumanize the people around me so that I can feel superior in some way. Right. And then when it comes back to innocence, which is a total deception on our part, all of our claim to innocence, it's like, oh man, we, we are so guilty. But yet we have these righteousness wars with each other. Right to the point now, it's like, have you noticed how, like in politics today, they're always trying to tell you one party's righteous and one party's not. Both parties are trying to demonize the other. We're no longer talking about issues and about, you know, how we can come to agreement or compromise or something like that. No, if you vote Republican or if you vote Democrat, you are evil because you are voting for a monster, right? 
um, we, we bring innocence and righteousness into the equation. And so all human activity, all human ambition is rooted in these five cravings. Corey, this was amazing. I wholeheartedly agree with this breakdown of the different cravings. All of them are so spot on. And I was particularly drawn to the innocence part, the 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 talk of righteousness, right? And I think to your point, and I think innocence and significance kind of almost go hand in hand or mm -hmm. even identity and security, all of it kind of, they layer in on each other. But I think everyone wants to feel like I'm, to what we were talking about in our conversation, what we weaved in, like that they're good enough, that they're not mm -hmm. weird. They're not going mm -hmm. to be left out of the group. And even if they might not be understood, they might not look like a, a certain way. Everyone wants to feel love and accepted. Mm -hmm. And I think sometimes my theory as to why we're so different or why we appear so different to each other when it comes to looks, when it comes to um, belief systems, all of that stuff. I think God is trying to stretch our love, our capacity for love and acceptance, even when we don't fully agree or understand someone else's perspective. And I think your point about politics, th that's my issue with the world a lot of times. It's this black and white, mm -hmm. um, in a figurative sense, yeah. line that people draw. Like It's like, it's either this or that. Right. Kind of like why I want to talk about the notion of truth. That's one of the layers of truth where it's either this or that, especially when it's politics. And if you don't completely hate one side, you're you might as well be on that side. Right. There's no middle ground for anything, for any sort of conversation. Um, so I just I love love this breakdown because I think you're spot on. And I think whenever people feel like they can't, they don't have a sense of identity. Their independence is potentially being threatened. They don't feel secure, significant, or they don't feel good enough. I'm using good mm -hmm. enough in, um, as a synonym for innocence. I know it's more than that. Mm -hmm. I do think it leads to a lot of aggression or mm -hmm. what people might consider sin, right? Um, well, I think if I could kind of put a bow on it for you, mm -hmm. there's an old saying that says, um, the loneliest mo moment in life happens when you experience what you thought would deliver the ultimate and it lets you down, right? And there are so many of us with this testimony, all of us for that matter. I thought when I got my PhD, I would be happy. And you get it and you're not happy. I thought if I would just get that million dollars, that boy, you know, life would be beautiful. Well, you get your million dollars and it's like, shoot, now I need to protect it. And you know what I really need? I think I need two million. And it's, it's never enough. But this idea that we just, they, because these cravings cannot be satisfied in any place other than the connection with their maker where they were designed to be satisfied. You can't, I saw an uh, interview with Elon Musk quite a while ago now, but the interviewer asked him, are you happy? Elon Musk, the richest man who's ever existed as far as we know. He paused for a moment in that Elon Musk type way. And he said, uh, I don't think many people would want to be me. And you just think, holy smokes, here's a guy who has everything, who can have anything the world has to offer, right? And he doesn't, nobody would want to be him. It's absolutely amazing. And so, but here's the bit, here's where I want to put the bow on it. So first off, you mentioned something. Sometimes we can, dis, we, as we look at our life, we can say, oh, I'm being, I'm being agitated in the significance area right now. Sometimes we can identify individuals. Sometimes they're blended like a rainbow. We don't know where one begins and the other ends. Right. Oftentimes that is that's the case with our great with our particular cravings. And the other thing is this, they are the definition of peace and happiness. I often say that peace is the mega goal of humanity. This is what we're hoping for. Peace is that point where all fears are stilled and all questions are answered. And that's the point that we're all trying to get to. We get up in the morning trying to get to that point of peace. And we Never seem to make it. But here's the point. In order to have peace, all five cravings have to be satisfied simultaneously. And that's the big thing. See, I can have all the security in the world. I feel like I'm safe. I am loved. You know, um, but if I don't know who I am, I don't have peace. Right? 
or I can feel safe and secure. I can know who I am. I can feel I have freedom and independence. I can feel like I am special. But if someone's making me feel guilty, I do not have peace. All five cravings have to be sem uh, satisfied simultaneously. And there's nothing on earth that can give you that in any lasting measure. Nothing. There's only one place where they can be satisfied, and that's in connection with our maker. Mm. Thank you, Corey, for such an amazing conversation and for sharing your perspective. Um, this is this has been great. I think the audience is going to really enjoy this discussion that we just had. Just to wrap up our conversation, I always like to ask a fun question at the end, and that is, have you shifted in perspective on anything lately? It could be something lighthearted or it could be as deep as you want it to be. Yeah. Oh, I'll give you a deep theological one. So as a theologian, it's tough to come to a shift, right? Um, but I feel like I'm, I'm, I may be shifting on one particular issue, and that is that I used to think that God... Um, had a strict plan and that God had a plan of where he wanted me to live. God had a plan of who he wanted me to marry. Um, and God orchestrated all this stuff kind of behind the scenes, kind of like to a certain degree, like a puppet master. Right. And, um, and in, in a good and beautiful way. Right. And there are, I still believe that in certain circumstances, but I've shifted in the sense that I now have come to believe through both living and through interpreting the scriptures, that God may not um, particularly care. I'll tell you what God cares about. God cares um, that you are living your best life in connection with him. That's what he cares about. He cares much less as to whether you live in Detroit or Philadelphia or whether you, you know, marry... Annabelle or Beth, right? Um, maybe he does, but he cares less about those things. He cares less you know, whether you work at the bank or whether you work at the gravel pit. But what he wants for you is that you live a full and beautiful life in connection with him. And for me, that's a major shift in my thinking that I've really been wrestling with lately. Beautiful. Thank you for sharing that, Corey. Where can people find you if they want to connect with you yeah. or buy your book? Oh, well, I'd say my book is available wherever books are sold. So if you just, um, a lot of people like Barnes & Noble, a lot of people like Amazon. Um, there's a million other little great little bookstores. Support your little local bookstore if you want to. Um, and you can really grab it anywhere it's available. It's available worldwide and wherever you'd like to get it. So. Thank you, Corey, for stopping by Shifting Dimensions. It was a pleasure speaking with you. A pleasure to be here. Thank you so much.